Representative Ilhan Omar laughs it up as a fake anti-Semitism resolution passes the House. The media, of course, try to blame Republicans for anti-Semitism, and we check the mailbag. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. I've rarely seen a moment as outrageous as this moment in American politics. And I don't mean outrageous as in hilarious or outstanding. I mean outrageous as in we should all be outraged. If you have a shred of morality left in your body, looking at how the Democrats are acting, looking at how the media are acting, it is truly astonishing. We'll get to all that in just one second. First, let's talk about saving money on your legal bills at your business. There are five things business owners can count on from LegalZoom. First, reliability. Over two million people have used LegalZoom to start their businesses. Second, experience. They've been helping all types of business owners for over 17 years. You can count on LegalZoom to help with all the details. I personally have been using LegalZoom for years. I am a lawyer and they have great legal resources. Number three, helpful support. They have the right people standing by ready for your questions, all based in the United States. Number four, legal advice. LegalZoom is not a law firm, but they have a network of independent attorneys licensed in all 50 states. They can help you review contracts, help with employment laws, advise you on many of the hurdles that pop up when you're running a business. And finally, number five, no surprises. LegalZoom provides complete transparency with upfront pricing, customer reviews, and a satisfaction guarantee. Check out LegalZoom today. See how they can make life better for you and your business. And don't forget to enter Ben at checkout to save even more. LegalZoom is where life meets legal. LegalZoom.com. Don't forget to enter Ben at checkout to save even more. LegalZoom.com, where life meets legal. Go check them out right now. So we begin today with this ridiculous stupid, foolhardy, obviously obfuscatory resolution from the House Democrats that was set to condemn, I kid you not, racism and bigotry against, and this is a direct quote, African Americans, Latinos, Native Americans, Asian Americans, and Pacific Islanders, and other people of color, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, the LGBTQ community, immigrants, and others with verbal attacks, incitement, and violence. So Jews come in, I believe, seventh on that list of peoples who are, who are protected under this resolution. And the resolution specifically calls out the effect of white supremacy, white supremacist anti-Semitism, among other, among other things that are targeted by white supremacists, other groups targeted by white supremacists. Let's remember, this resolution that was sponsored in the House yesterday and passed overwhelmingly was a direct response to Representative Ilhan Omar, Democrat of Minnesota, who is an open anti-Semite, who has apologized some three times in the last six weeks, or quasi-apologized, or not apologized, for three separate openly anti-Semitic statements. One, she suggested that Israel, the Jews, had hypnotized the world with their Jew powers. Second, that Jewish money lay behind American support for Israel. And third, that American supporters of Israel were, in fact, loyal to Israel itself. And so those are all three anti-Semitic statements. Not one of them has to do with Israeli policy. So what do the Democrats do? First, they remove Ilhan Omar's name from an anti-Semitism resolution. Then they say, you know what? We can't condemn anti-Semitism because people might read between the lines and see we're talking about Ilhan Omar. So instead, what we will do is we'll condemn all bad things. And then just to make sure that we obfuscate the rationale for this whole thing, we'll talk about white supremacy as though that's the issue of the last six weeks. Now, recall, there was a House resolution passed against white supremacy in January. It was voted for unanimously in the House. So this is nothing new. The only thing that is new here is that Democrats are openly pandering on behalf of Ilhan Omar. They decided that they were, it was more important to greenlight anti-Semitism from members of their intersectional base than it was for them to condemn anti-Semitism. It is, in fact, that simple. It is that easy. They passed a seven-page resolution that is filled with all sorts of randomness, specifically in order to avoid talking about Ilhan Omar. That's all this was. So this thing passes overwhelmingly because Democrats are passing something that is quote unquote unobjectionable. But there are some people on the right who don't vote for it. Why? Because they say openly, we're not voting for this thing because it's an open and obvious attempt to obfuscate the actual issue here, which is the anti-Semitism of a member of the House who is not even being removed from the Foreign Affairs Committee. And, and so how do the media react to that? They say, oh, look, Republicans are pro-anti-Semitism. I'll explain how all this works. So let's begin with the various players talking about this idiotic resolution, which is designed to, again, cover for Ilhan Omar's anti-Semitism. That is the only reason that this resolution came to the floor, and it's the only reason it is this broad, condemning all the things. So here's Nancy Pelosi yesterday talking about the resolution right before its passage. I don't, I don't think that, um, that the Congresswoman is... Uh, uh, 
perhaps appreciate the full weight of how it's heard by other people, although I don't believe it was intended in any anti-Semitic way. We're working on something that is one resolution addressing these, these forms of hatred, not mentioning her name, because it's not about her. It's about uh, the, these forms of hatred. So Pelosi says, Pelosi explicitly says it's not about her, except for how this whole thing is about her. This whole thing is about Ilhan Omar. The only reason we're having this discussion is because she keeps saying anti-Semitic stuff because she knows what she is saying and she doesn't care because she's an anti-Semite. But Pelosi openly acknowledges that this resolution is designed to avoid talking about all of this. Representative Ted Deutsch, maybe the only honest Democrat left in the Democratic caucus, he gets up on the floor of the House and he talks about how the resolution really should only address anti-Semitism, but his fellow Democrats are too gutless to do that. This is not political. No one should make it political. The use of anti-Semitic language and images can never be tolerated. What's been so difficult for so many people in my community is that people who are fearful when anti-Semitic tropes are used are being told that they're wrong. When a colleague invokes classic anti-Semitic lies three times, then this body must condemn that anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is worthy of being taken seriously on its own. It's worthy of being singularly called out. Words matter. For generations, they have had dangerous consequences for me, for my family, and for my people. This shouldn't be so hard. Okay, that of course is exactly right. That's Representative Ted Deutsch, a Democrat from Florida, who is saying exactly the right thing. Now, Deutsch and his colleagues have been attacked by people like Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez and Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib for having the audacity to say the truth about Ilhan Omar. They've been, they've been attacked. They've been, they've been, it has been suggested that they are trying to shut down debate. And all the 2020 leading Democratic candidates have come out in favor of Ilhan Omar. Most strongly, of course, Bernie Sanders, which is of most use to members of the left who want to claim that this isn't anti-Semitic. They point to Bernie Sanders. They say, well, if Bernie green lights, I mean, Bernie's Jewish. Okay, Bernie Sanders has about as much connection to, a, to, to the Jewish community as a ham sandwich, meaning he was born Jewish. He is an overt atheist. He's a radically anti-Israel socialist. Like, where exactly is his deep connection to Judaism? It doesn't exist. But he is convenient to use because, of course, he is ethnically Jewish. So that allows people to use him as cover. In any case, Representative Lee Zeldin, who actually is Jewish, he is the Republican member of the House, who is Jewish, he said, I'm not going to vote for this garbage resolution because this garbage resolution is specifically designed to, to cover up for Ilhan Omar being an anti-Semite. We are here today right now because of anti-Semitic rhetoric from one member of this chamber said again and again and again. If that member was a Republican, that member's name would be in this resolution. And this resolution would be all about condemning anti-Semitism and it would be done so forcefully. I apparently uh, am giving Rep. Omar more credit than uh, the speaker is because I don't believe she is naive. I believe that she knows exactly what she's doing. Anti-Semitism must be condemned unequivocally and emphatically. Support of Israel, support of Jews standing against anti-Semitism has been bipartisan in the past. It should be bipartisan today and should be bipartisan for every moment in the future. Okay, everything that he says is right. And of course, Representative Zeldin is Jewish. And not only Jewish, he is pro-Israel, he has deep connections with the Jewish community. So he votes against this resolution, as do 22 other Republicans. And those same 23 Republicans who voted against that resolution voted in favor of a resolution back in January to condemn white supremacism. Right? So this is not about them suddenly siding with white supremacy. That's a lie. The reason that Republicans didn't vote, a few Republicans didn't vote for the resolution yesterday, is because they didn't want to grant cover to Ilhan Omar. It is that simple. But that's not how the media played it. That's not how the media played it. The way the media played it, they said that the Republicans didn't vote for this resolution covering for anti-Semitism because the Republicans are the real anti-Semites. So notice the insane gaslighting here. A Democratic representative, a fresh face on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine, so fresh, so face, with AOC, with Nancy Pelosi, that fresh face is a blatant, brutal anti-Semite, a Jew hater. And the House won't condemn her. The House Democrats won't condemn her. And then they brought in a basic resolution condemning anti-Semitism into a wishy-washy resolution condemning everything except for, apparently, radical Muslim anti-Semitism. They won't condemn that. 
The only thing that they will condemn is everything else. Everything else will be condemned, but they will exempt Ilhan Omar. And then some Republicans say, listen, I'm not going to vote for that for that ridiculous resolution you're putting forward that is specifically designed to cover for anti-Semites. I won't vote for that. And the media's take, oh, Republicans won't vote for an anti-hate resolution. Who's hateful now, Republicans? This is so wildly intellectually dishonest. It is such incredible gaslighting. And the media are complicit in it. They are, because all they, honest to God, these people are just stenographers for the radical left. Michael Barbro of the New York Times, who hosts The Daily, he tweeted out, so far, 14 House Republicans have voted against a bill condemning anti-Semitism, anti-Muslim, and other hatred. Wow, this is going to be hard to explain. Is it? I just explained it in less than 15 seconds. It's really not hard to explain. When you pass a stupid resolution designed to cover for anti-Semites by watering it down until it is anodyne, when people vote against that, they're not voting in favor of anti-Semitism. They're voting against watering down resolutions against anti-Semitism in order to cover for Democrats. But not for Michael Barbaro of the New York Times. So look at the now who's the anti-Semite Republicans. And it's not just Michael Barbaro. Jake Sherman of Politico tweeted this out. I called him on it, and then he tried to back down. He tweeted out, House Democrats have been under pressure for a week on anti-Semitism, but House Republicans have bailed them out. House Republicans have bailed them out on anti-Semitism. Number three, House Representative Liz Cheney, Lee Zeldin, and Louis Gohmert vote no. Jeff Duncan present. An embarrassing moment for House GOP. Really? It's an embarrassing moment for Republicans when they refuse to go along with your cover-up for anti-Semitism? Go back to that tweet for a second. The people he mentions there. Lee Zeldin, a Jew. Louis, Louis Gohmert, the representative from Texas, is the most philo-Semitic member of the House I personally know. That's insane. Representative Liz Cheney herself put out a statement explaining why she voted like this. Quote, today's resolution vote was a sham put forward by Democrats to avoid condemning one of their own and denouncing vile anti-Semitism. While I stand wholeheartedly against discrimination outlined in this resolution, the language before the House today did not address the issue that is front and center. Representative Omar's comments were wrong, and she has proven multiple times she embodies a vile, hate-filled, anti-Semitic, anti-Israel bigotry. She deserves to be rebuked by name and removed from the House Foreign Affairs Committee so there is no mistake about the values and priorities that the House stands for. For Democratic leadership to kowtow to their radical members and refuse to offer legislative language that criticizes Representative Omar's statements in the strongest possible manner confirms what we already knew, that their party is controlled by far-left extremists who can't even muster the courage to stand up to blatant anti-Semitism. That's why Liz Cheney voted against the resolution. But the media say, oh no, she did it because really secretly she's the anti-Semite. See, if you don't go along with the cover-up, that means that you're the real anti-Semite. And the media go along with that. Politico, New York Times, and not just them, not just them. You'll see how they are stenographers for AOC and her radical crew in just a second. First, let's talk about the window coverings in your house. Window treatments is one of those terms that you don't think about all that much because I mean, why would you? But if you look around your house and you realize that it doesn't look that great, the reason is because your window coverings stink. Instead, you need some good stuff from Blinds.com. Blinds.com makes it really easy for you. Not sure what you want, even where to start with Blinds.com, you get a free online design consultation. Just send them pictures of your house they send back custom recommendations from a professional for what will work with your color scheme, furniture, and specific rooms. They will even send you free samples to make sure everything looks as good in person as it does online, and every order gets free shipping. And here's the best part. If you accidentally mismeasure or pick the wrong color, if you make a mistake, Blinds.com will remake your blinds for free. They've made it really easy for you, so there's no excuse to leave up those mangled blinds that make your place look like a set from The Wire. And for a limited time, get 20% off everything at Blinds.com when you use promo code BEN. That is Blinds.com, promo code BEN for 20% off everything. Faux wood blinds, cellular shades, roller shades, and more. That's Blinds.com, promo code BEN. Rules and restrictions do apply. Blinds.com, promo code BEN for 20% off everything. Okay, so as you see, members of the media taking dictation, taking dictation, from AOC. And I'll prove it to you. Here is what AOC had to say about this. Here's what she tweeted out. This would be 20. Quote, where's the outrage over the 23 GOP members who voted no on a resolution condemning bigotry today? Oh, there's none? Did they get called out, raked over, ambushed in halls and relentlessly asked why not? No? Okay, got it. This is so insanely dishonest, but she, look, she's, dis she's a damn liar, AOC. She's been a liar since she was running. And now she's even more of a liar. Everybody knows what happened here. AOC provided active cover for an open anti-Semite. And now she's saying the people who didn't help her provide that cover are the real anti-Semites. 
Ooh, they're the real anti-Semites. Not you, who have provided cover every step of the way for the Jeremy Corbynization of your party. You who bragged two weeks ago that you were on the phone with vicious, brutal, pro-terror anti-Semite Jeremy Corbyn two frickin' weeks ago. You who have campaigned with Linda Sarsour. We're supposed to pretend that you are standing up to anti-Semitism and the people who stood up to you are the real anti-Semites? This is sheer, absolute, unmitigated garbage, and the media have been repeating it at every turn because the media are stenographers for Democrats. End of story. It's shocking. It really is. And for those who believe that there was a real, genuine effort to fight anti-Semitism yesterday by the Democrats, I present to you Ilhan Omar's response to all of this. First of all, Omar actually went out and was hugging people on the House floor yesterday after this resolution passed. Why not? She defeated Nancy Pelosi. But then she released a statement. And here was her statement that was released alongside Rashida Tlaib, another anti-Semite, and Andre Carson of Indiana, who is also a Muslim, but I have no evidence he's an anti-Semite. They issued the following statement after the House voted overwhelmingly to condemn all kinds of hate. Quote, today is historic on many fronts. It's the first time we have voted on a resolution condemning anti-Muslim bigotry in our nation's history. Anti-Muslim crimes have increased 99 percent from 2014 to 2016 and are still on the rise. Are you getting this? Are you getting this? Ilhan Omar said anti-Semitic stuff and today is celebrating a resolution to condemn Islamophobia. You reading this? Then she gets to anti-Semitism. What does she say? We are tremendously proud to be part of a body that has put forth a condemnation of all forms of bigotry, including anti-Semitism, racism and white supremacy. At a time when extremism is on the rise, we must explicitly denounce religious intolerance of all kinds and acknowledge the pain felt by all communities. Our nation is having a, a difficult conversation, and we believe this is great progress. So this is the code now. Difficult conversation is I say something blatantly anti-Semitic, and then we cover for me. That's what, that's, that, hey, that's a conversation, guys. That's what Ilhan Omar says. And you can tell that Ilhan Omar is real sorry about all of her anti-Semitism. Yesterday, she retweeted a particular tweet by a guy named Mehdi Hassan. Mehdi Hassan tweeted something out about Meghan McCain. So we have to reverse course. Meghan McCain was on The View. Meghan McCain does an excellent job on The View of representing decency and conservatism. So yesterday she was talking about anti-Semitism being glossed over by the Democrats. And she got emotional. Here's what it sounded like. The idea that this is politicized, I'm really not, I was very nervous to talk about this on the show because I thought it would become politicized and it really shouldn't be. On both sides, it should be called out. Right. Mm -hmm. And just because I don't technically have Jewish family that are blood related to me, it doesn't mean I don't take this as seriously. And it is very dangerous, very dangerous. And I think we all collectively as Americans on both sides and what Ilhan Omar is saying is very scary to me and it's very scary to a lot of people. And I don't think you have to be Jewish to recognize you don't. that. Of course, she is exactly right. So what did Ilhan Omar do? The, what, what's so offensive about what she said? She said, Ilhan Omar's comments are anti-Semitic and anti-Semitism is bad. So Mehdi Hassan, he is a columnist for Al Jazeera. <laughs> He's a columnist for The Intercept, which is a wild, radical left publication that is supremely anti-Israel and is quite friendly with anti-Semitism. He's a host on Al Jazeera English. He tweeted out, quote, Megan's late father literally sang bomb, 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 bomb Iran and insisted on referring to his Vietnamese captors as gooks. He also, lest we forget, gave the world Sarah Palin. So a little less faux outrage over a former refugee turned freshman representative, please. So this Al Jazeera host's response is not that Ilhan Omar isn't anti-Semitic. It's that Megan McCain's dad is a bad guy. So Megan McCain should shut up about anti-Semitism. And who retweeted that? Oh, Ilhan Omar retweeted that, of course, because she is not in the slightest embarrassed or upset by her anti-Semitism. She's quite happy about it. And why shouldn't she be happy about it? The entire Democratic Party just caved and covered for her. Why shouldn't she be overjoyed at the treatment that she has just received? We know who's in the driver's seat now, and it's the anti-Semites. And by the way, let's not pretend that this has nothing to do with, with anti-Semitism when it comes to when it comes to Ilhan Omar's comments. Eli Valley is another radical left cartoonist. Sometimes I believe he's associated with some of the folks at The Intercept. And Eli Valley put out this cartoon. You should subscribe so you can actually see what the cartoon looks like. It is straight from the pages of Der Sturmer. It is a Nazi cartoon. Okay, Eli Valley puts out a cartoon and it shows Megan McCain wearing a cross necklace. And in one hand, she has a box of matzo ball soup mix. And he makes her look, of course, hideous and, and overweight and all of this. And in the other hand, she has a, a Jewish star marked Yud, like Yudin, as in like the Nazi yellow star. And, and then she has on the table in front of her a copy of Yentl and, and a book called Jewish Race Explained. 
and says the things she said about the Holy Land, that refugee girl wants to exterminate us Jews. I mean, this is straight up. It is straight up Jew hatred. And the attempt to suggest that Meghan McCain doesn't know what she's talking about because she's not Jewish and therefore she shouldn't care about anti-Semitism. Like, it, the radical left is fine with anti-Semitism. They're not just fine with it. They are enthusiastic about anti-Semitism. They're supremely enthusiastic about anti-Semitism, in fact. And, and it's, it's obvious that they are. They've been tolerating Linda Sarsour in their midst, toler celebrating Linda Sarsour. Yesterday, Linda Sarsour was asked if Israel has a right to exist. Now, there's a lot of anti-Israel criticism, criticism of Israel policy that is not anti-Semitic. Saying that Israel has no right to exist, that's actually anti-Semitic. A lot of anti-Israel commentary, not anti-Semitic. Israel has no right to exist, anti-Semitic. That means the wiping out of some six million Jews in the Middle East and supplanting it with a radical Islamic di dictatorship. Okay, that is what people like Linda Sarsour would like. So Linda Sarsour was asked specifically about this, and I'll show you her response and the response of her bodyguards in just a minute. But first, let's talk about hiring. Hiring can be challenging, but there's one place you can go where hiring is simple, fast, and smart. A place where growing businesses connect to qualified candidates. That place is ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. ZipRecruiter sends your job to over 100 of the web's leading job boards, but they don't stop there. With their powerful matching technology, ZipRecruiter scans thousands of resumes to find people with the right experience and then invites them to apply to your job. As applications come in, ZipRecruiter analyzes each one and spotlights the top candidates, so you're never going to miss a great match. ZipRecruiter is so effective that 80% of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site within the very first day. Right now, my listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. That is ZipRecruiter.com slash D-A-I-L-Y-W-I-R-E, ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. ZipRecruiter is indeed the smartest way to hire. Go check them out for free and give them a try. ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. There's a reason we use ZipRecruiter here at the Daily Wire offices to make sure that we find the best employees quickly. ZipRecruiter is the smartest way to hire. All righty, so Linda Sarsour is good proof of just where the Democratic Party now stands, what they are willing to stand for. So here was Linda Sarsour yesterday being asked whether the state of Israel has a right to exist. And then wait till you hear what her bodyguards have to say to people asking her the question. Linda, do you believe the state of Israel has a right to exist? We'll answer questions later after the press conference. Thank you, Linda. I'll, I'll be happy I'm, to answer that. My name is Sean. So let's go right now this since we've been de Linda. delayed. We're going now to Are you going to take questions, office. Linda? Do you believe the nation of Israel has a right to exist? Do you believe the nation of Israel has a right to exist? Why are you blocking me, sir? Why are you blocking me? Well, these guys are jumping are in front of me. Linda Sarsour, does the nation of Israel have a right to resolution? exist? We are currently. She is ignoring me. Why are you guys pushing me here? To actually expand Talk to the language. Me. She said she would answer questions. Why are you here? She said she would answer questions. She has not. Why what do you care? Do you work for Israel? Conference. How much do you get paid? How much do you get paid? Do you work for Israel? That's just a reporter asking Linda Sarsour if she believes the state of Israel should exist. Linda Sarsour is very close with Ilhan Omar and AOC and the rest of the Democratic leadership. She campaigned for Kirsten Gillibrand. Don't tell me the Democratic Party isn't comfortable with anti-Semitism. They are embracing it with both arms. Not one arm, both arms. It's, it's absolutely incredible. By the way, and the, and the media, again, are playing, are playing stenographer for the Democrats. To this point, David Duke came out yesterday and he said that Ilhan Omar is deeply important. He tweeted out a photo of Ilhan Omar, a Somali woman of Muslim descent, with a, a love emoji saying, by defiance to the Zionist occupied government. Ilhan Omar is now the most important member of the U.S. Congress. So David Duke tweets out. Now, I'm old enough to remember when President Trump's failure to condemn David Duke in the 2016 election led to a million headlines. How many headlines have there been about David Duke embracing Ilhan Omar or Andrew Anglin, the head of the Daily Stormer, the neo-Nazi newspaper, embracing Ilhan Omar? How many headlines have there been about that? How much has CNN covered that? And I don't want to hear that David Duke is now irrelevant. If he's irrelevant now, he was irrelevant two years ago. So you're going to have to explain to me why he's not relevant as soon as Democrats get embraced by David Duke. And Richard Spencer, by the way, loves Ilhan Omar. There's no hiding of the ball here. Everybody knows what is going on, but the media are lying about it. And they are facilitating the lie. And it's absolutely horrifying. Now, what exactly is going to be the outcome of all of this? Well, it's pretty obvious that the Democratic Party has been taken over by the radicals. And as I've been saying for the past several days, the Democratic Party may not be fully anti-Semitic, but they are happy to embrace anti-Semitism if it means that they get to make common cause with the radical socialist base. That's what's going on here. That's why Bernie Sanders was first out of the gate defending Ilhan Omar. That's the real story. So President Trump comes out today and he is talking about this resolution 
and he says that he thought it was disgraceful, and then he characterizes the Democratic Party. I thought yesterday's vote by the House was disgraceful because it's become, the Democrats have become an anti-Israel party. They've become an anti-Jewish party. And I thought that vote was a disgrace. And so does everybody else if you get an honest answer. If you get an honest answer from politicians, they thought it was a disgrace. The Democrats have become an anti-Israel party. They've become an anti-Jewish party. And that's too bad. Okay, there is no question that what he is saying is correct. I mean, that is just correct. Now, you can rip on Trump all you want, but forget about who's saying it. Is, has the Democratic Party become anti-Israel? There's no question they have. They became anti-Israel under the auspices of Barack Obama, who is a radically anti-Israel president, a man who helped lie to the American people, helped lie, promulgated a massive lie to the American people in order to push forward an Iran deal that endangers the state of Israel, a man who allowed anti-Israel resolutions to go forward at the UN Security Council, a man who attempted to block Defense Department aid to Israel in the middle of the Gaza War in 2014. Barack Obama was radically anti-Israel. His administration was radically anti-Israel. There's just, there's no other way to put that. And as far as them being an anti-Jewish party, they just proved it yesterday. I mean, they proved it on the floor of the House. So everybody's going to say, oh, well, Trump and Charlottesville and David Duke and all this. Fine. Say all that's true. Say that President Trump said some really bad stuff a couple of years ago, that he made common cause with anti-Semites, or at least was silent toward them, or winked and nodded at them in 2015, 2016, and into 2017. Say all those things. The Democratic Party, the approval of Israel inside the Democratic Party is at all-time lows. It is well below 50%. In the Republican Party, it is up near 80%. And when it comes to the anti-Jewish nature of the parties, there is no question which party has full-scale embraced an anti-Jewish perspective. And that is the Democratic Party. A President Trump got shellacked by the vast majority of elected Republicans after Charlottesville. He got killed during the primaries by people like me. I'm waiting to hear Democrats come forth and condemn Ilhan Omar. They couldn't even do it in a vote. The entire party infrastructure was just taken over by the anti-Semites. So forget whatever you think about Trump. Because that's not the question today. The question is what's happening with the Democratic Party. We can condemn anti-Semitism wherever it comes from. Unless you're a Democrat, then you only condemn anti-Semitism if it's white supremacists. We saw that from Paul Krugman yesterday, who said he's only scared of right-wing anti-Semitism. You know, ask the Jews in the Middle East, ask the Jews in Europe, ask the Jews who are being beaten on the streets of Brooklyn, not by white supremacists, but by members of the intersectional coalition. Ask them which type of anti-Semitism is dangerous. The answer is all, but it is the left that is openly embracing anti-Semitism and allowing it to guise itself as just mere anti-Israel talk. It's sheer nonsense. Now, this all has consequences. By the way, Ilhan Omar completely unrepentant today. She, she was profiled by Politico. She said, I am certainly not looking to be comfortable. I don't want everyone necessarily to feel comfortable around me. I think really the most exciting things happen when people are extremely uncomfortable. Yes, making the Jews uncomfortable every day, Ilhan Omar. And then you have Anna Palmer, a reporter for Politico, saying, I've heard this from more than one freshman Democrat when asked about Omar's comfort, uh, comments. They use the word uncomfortable often. Need for those types of conversations. So Democrats are now saying, anti-Semitism, let's have a conversation. Let's have a conversation. And then Politico has another story out today about how Bernie Sanders raced to support Ilhan Omar knowing that a lot of people on the left would be very happy with an ethnic Jews defending Ilhan Omar. Matt Continetti, has, Matt Continetti, the editor of the Washington Free Beacon, has a really good piece out today. He says, if anti-Semitism is the price of a socialist America, so be it. Obviously, that is true. Obviously, that is true. Now, we'll get to what this means for the future of the Democratic Party in just one second. First, you're going to have to go over to dailywire.com and subscribe. Go subscribe right now over at dailywire.com. Get the rest of our show live for $9.99 a month. Then you can also get two hours additionally in the afternoon. We're having on Representative Lee Zeldin a little bit later today to talk about this ridiculous resolution. Also, when you, when you spend $99 a year, you get the Leftist Tears Tumblr. This world-famous Leftist Tears Tumblr. Today, we are featuring a Daily Wire premium subscriber. We wanted to give a shout out to a different subscriber every week as a thank you for helping support The Daily Wire because who wouldn't want to get a shout out on the largest, fastest growing conservative podcast in America? This week's shout out goes to Nathan at Town, it's T-O-N-N 85 on Twitter. Nathan is flying high in the sky while sipping those leftist tears still hot at that great altitude. Nathan, excellent shot of the Tumblr. Thanks for being a subscriber. If you want to receive one of the most amazing shout outs you've ever experienced, 
make your life worthwhile. Right here on The Ben Shapiro Show, you have to be an annual subscriber. You have to post a photo of your Tumblr on either Twitter or Instagram with the hashtag Leftist Tears Tumblr. You can even be in the photo if you'd like, or you don't have to be. Just send us those photos. So go check us out, subscribe, get the rest of the show live. Also, we have a great Sunday special coming up this week with Arthur Brooks at American Enterprise Institute. When you subscribe, you get that a day early on Saturday. We're always upgrading our content. We answer questions during the during the breaks of our radio show sometimes. So, so lots of stuff going on when you subscribe. Go check us out also at YouTube, iTunes. Leave us a review. We always appreciate it. We are the largest, fastest growing conservative podcast and radio show in America. So what are the consequences for Nancy Pelosi having handed over control of her party to AOC and Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib and the anti-Semites and enablers who are the fresh faces of the Democratic Congress? So fresh, so face. Politico has a piece today. Here's what they say. They have gathered in defiance of the freezing temperatures on a late February night, scores of them twirling Somali flags in one hand and American flags in the other, crowding the arrivals terminal and waiting to welcome one of their own. The vast Somali community in the Twin Cities is like one sprawling extended family, explains Ali Aden, a 39-year-old engineer who came to the U.S. two decades ago as we survey the scene. When a prominent member of the family arrives, it's customary to greet them this way. Is it Congresswoman Omar they're waiting for, I ask, rep- referencing the freshman Democrat whose district we're standing in? Ilhan, he smiles broadly. No, no. If it were Ilhan, the whole city would be here. Instead, it was just to meet some obscure Somali dignitary. But... Omar is a rock star in her district. In her district. Also, she's on Rolling Stone, so I guess Democrats are trying to make this anti-Semite an actual rock star. Omar was destined to stand out. After Congress changed its 181-year-old rule prohibiting headwear to accommodate her, she became the first person to wear a hijab on the House floor. But it wasn't her wardrobe or her religion or her gripping biography as Congresswoman who came of age in a refugee camp that distinguished Omar in her early days on Capitol Hill. Rather, it was her usage of social media and the uproar that ensued. And then talks about her anti-Semitic comments. And then she talks about what exactly, and then she talks about what exactly her perspective is. And her perspective is that they need to make Jews uncomfortable, and they also need to move in a, an incredibly socialist direction. Omar says, I'm certainly not looking to be comfortable. I don't want to make everyone necessarily feel comfortable around me. I think the most exciting things happen when people are extremely uncomfortable. And then she says, this is the best part of it. She starts ripping on Barack Obama, right? She says that Barack Obama was a problem. She says the hope and change offered by Barack Obama was a mirage. Recalling the caging of kids at the U.S.-Mexico border and the droning of countries around the world on Obama's watch, she argues that the Democratic president operated within the same fundamentally broken framework as his Republican successor. We can't only be upset with Trump. His policies are bad, but many of the people who came before him also had really bad policies. They just were more polished than he was, Omar says. And that's not what we should be looking for anymore. We don't want anybody to get away with murder because they are polished. We want to recognize the actual policies that are behind the pretty face and the smile. So she is ripping on Barack Obama and she wants a socialist takeover of the Democratic Congress. She says, I don't believe that tiptoeing is the way to win the hearts and minds of the people. I get saddened by some of my freshman colleagues who can't understand that within their districts, the idea of Medicare for all is extremely popular. The Green New Deal is a very popular idea in their districts. Making sure that we have a final fix to our broken immigration system is very popular in their districts. What they pay attention to is the rhetoric that says this is a red to blue district. You have to be careful. You can't talk about these policies. Well, in reality, these people are like everyone else. They struggle with the cost of health care. They struggle with our broken infrastructure. They struggle with having an economy that brings them into the 21st century. And we have to be willing to have those conversations. Facing another round of denunciations, Omar refused to back down. This is all Politico kissing her rear. What ensued was a week of unmitigated chaos within House Democratic ranks. Senior Democrats pushed for a vote on a resolution condemning anti-Semitism. Younger Democrats rallied behind Omar and objected to her being singled out. And the party's leadership, desperate to defuse the situation, finally settled on a catch-all version of the resolution, condemning all forms of hate speech, including against Native Americans and Pacific Islanders. It was a clear-cut victory for Omar and her allies on the left. In a preview of her defiance, just hours before the videotaped comments thrust the Congresswoman back into the national limelight, Omar told me that Washington should get used to her troublemaking. As much as other people are uncomfortable, I'm excited about the change in tone that has taken place. That is extremely positive, she says. And my ability, I think, to agitate our foreign policy discussions in a way that many of my colleagues who have been anti-intervention, anti-war have been unable to do in the past. So I'm okay with taking the blows if it means it will ignite conversations that no one was willing to have before. Ah, you see, she's just igniting conversations. That's all that's happening. It's not that she's a radical anti-Semite who is open about her anti-Semitism. She's, she's 
igniting conversations. Well, Nancy Pelosi gets to own this crap now. Nancy, you own this. You decided to surrender your party to these people. You bought the ticket. Now you take the ride. You wanted a Bernie Sanders led party. You got it, lady. You made this happen. You decided to surrender your party to the intersectional socialist mix. And Bernie Sanders decided to surrender his socialism to the intersectional contingent in the hopes that they would support him in the presidential race. Bernie Sanders, there is no question, is the front runner for the Democratic nomination at this point. Why? Because he is willing to pander to the intersectional base while being overtly socialist. There's a reason that Bernie Sanders came out, he knows better, and decided to openly embrace the anti-Semitic members of his own contingent and to pretend that their anti-Semitism was just anti-Israel rhetoric. Make no mistake, the Democratic left knows exactly what it's doing. And now it's going to get it good and hard. They voted for us, they're going to get it good and hard. Because if you think the American people stand with the Democratic Party in their willingness to embrace anti-Semitism this way, you got another thing coming. If you think the American people are interested in embracing socialism and radical anti-Semitism, and that's going to be your platform, you got another thing coming, guys. And you may think you can get away with it because Trump is unpopular. But here's the important thing to remember. President Trump is going to run against someone. It's not just going to be a referendum on Trump. It's going to be a referendum on how radical Democrats decide to be. The American people do not agree with this stuff. I still have enough confidence in the American people to believe that they hate anti-Semitism and that they are appalled by what they saw yesterday from the Democrats and that they are appalled by Ilhan Omar's statements and that they are appalled by the radical socialism that is being pressed forward with the support of an intersectional coalition rooted in a hatred of America's hierarchical system. And that's the contention of intersectionality. America has a hierarchical system and we know it's a, we need to band together to wreck it. Most Americans don't believe that. Most Americans are not willing to be separated into groups this way and then targeted by group if you don't fall inside the intersectional coalition. How, how, what, what a sad moment for the country, seriously. I'm not somebody who puts a lot of faith in the Democratic Party to do the right thing, as you know. But it's a sad moment for the country. I didn't think it would come to this. I really didn't. Not this quickly, anyway. There were early indicators the Democratic Party was going to move in an anti-Semitic direction. I mean, obviously, they've been tolerating Louis Farrakhan for years. Barack Obama sat in Jeremiah Wright's church for 20 years. But the full-scale embrace, that was something I was not expecting, and I don't think many people were. All right, time for some questions in the mailbag. So let's see. Steven says, hey, Ben, my question is something I'm supposed to do for school. I'm supposed to ask multiple people the definition of what rhetoric is to help form my own. Can you tell me how you would define rhetoric? Thanks, huge fan. Well, I mean, rhetoric, I think, is argumentative style. It is, it is the choice of, of whether to use emotion or logic in a particular argument, how you reach out to people. Now, that's how I would define rhetoric. And it can be good, it can be bad. But I think the, the way you express arguments is, is very clearly linked to how convincing those arguments are. Christian says, hi, Ben. I'm an 18-year-old with ADD. I want to read books, but whenever I try to read, my mind will linger, and I don't comprehend what I am reading and or will get very bored very fast. Do you have any advice for getting in the habit of reading and focusing while reading. Well, you know, I will tell you that for me, listening to audiobooks sometimes helps me concentrate more. I don't know if you, you may be more of an, an oral learner, meaning A-U-R-A-L, like a, a, a person who learns via listening. If you listen to this podcast, for example, it's basically a fire hose of information. You may get the same thing from audio listening to books, or if you really want to slow down and comprehend what you are reading, I would suggest a couple of things. One is you can read some of the parts out loud. Two is something that I've started to do. I never used to underline in my books because I don't like defacing books. I, I sort of treat books with reverence. But one of the things I've started to do, also because I can do it on Sabbath, is I get those little tabs that allow you to sort of tab a certain page, you know, little stickies. And I use them when I'm reading. And that helps me focus in because just the mere action of having to focus in on what I want to tab allows me to concentrate a little bit better. Daniel says, do you think the increase in radical left-wing activity in the Democratic Party is going to create an increase in radical right-wing activity as a counter reaction from the Republicans. Well, I, I do think that there is always the fact that people in response to bad coalitions tend to form bad coalitions. And I think it's one of the reasons that President Trump winked and nodded at the alt-right in 2016 and so many people were willing to go along with that. I think it was because he was suggesting that the end of the world was nigh, so you make common cause with the people who are willing to make common cause with you no matter how vile. So that would not be surprising to me. In fact, I think that we've already seen that. I think the Democrats, because they are polarized by President Trump, have decided they're going to go as far left as they can and embrace the most radical segments of their own base. As we segment ourselves off societally, and as we see the other side increasingly as the enemy, 
this, this thing turns into a spiral of hatred that's going to get worse, I think. Rachel says, greetings, Ben. I have to write a paper for my class forming an argument either for or against keeping the Electoral College. Which side would you take and why? Well, I'm in favor of keeping the Electoral College because I do think that states matter. The entire bargain of the Electoral College was that the popular vote was not sufficient. You don't want the entire presidency simply being decided by people who live in New York City and Los Angeles. You'd prefer that people in Montana have a say. Now, I know there are a lot of people who say, well, you know, that's, that's really bad. The Senate is the same thing. We've seen this call from Democrats now. The Senate is a terrible place because it's non-representative. The original bargain of the United States is a federalist system, not a full-on not a full-on democracy, not an American democracy, a federalist system where states and the federal government split authority and the states have a share in deciding how federal authority is allocated. That's the argument in favor of the Electoral College. And then says, if AOC runs for president in 2024, would you run for president just to get that debate with her? Uh, Shapiro 2024. If AOC ran for president in 20, listen, to, to get me to run for president, I think would be, would be a heavy lift. It seems like a terrible job and campaigning all the time seems quite awful. But honestly, if I felt it was the best way to help the country, I would do it. Uh, Philip says, hey, Ben, I very much like the idea of a convention of states. What amendments would you propose to curb the abuse of power by the federal government? What could be added to protect the Constitution from the branches running over it roughshod? Thanks, Philip. Well, I think, first of all, one of the great things about a convention of states is that it reawakens and reinvigorates people's interest in the Constitution. In the end, the Constitution is a set of parchment barriers. If the American people are not willing to stand up, if the, if, the, if the American people are not willing to stand up to violations of the Constitution, then they are going to allow the Constitution to be undercut. Obviously, as far as amendments, I would like to see, I've said before, I would like to see an amendment that forces all congressional pieces of legislation to be shorter than 10 pages in plain language. I would like to see them be on single topics, no more omnibus packages. I would like to see the, the abolition of departments of government from the executive branch because the executive branch simply has too much power. Administrative government should end. That's where I would start. Trevor says, hey, Ben, where do you see the Democratic Party going with respect to their increased radicalism? And if they lose in 2020, do you think they'll triple down on their radical views? Love the show, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, once you go radical, you rarely go back. There's rarely a turn back to moderation after you go completely radical. Now, if they get shellacked, if they get destroyed, then you might see sort of a Jimmy Carter response to George McGovern from 1972 to 1976. The Democrats saying, listen, we, we've gone too far. We've lost the American people. But given that the American electorate is already so closely divided, I don't think that's going to happen. I think they're going to move increasingly in a radical direction. Nathan says, hey, Ben, I'm a new subscriber. I've been a big fan of your show for almost two years. How many books would you say you own? Do we get to see a tour of your library? Also, what are you, some of your favorite books that you own? Well, I have, last count, 5,000 books, something like that. Basically, every place in my house is covered with books. In fact, I've been reading Marie Kondo, and I'm thinking about going and giving away some of the books that I'm not going to reread. And that makes me sad because I love books so much. Um, you know, some of my favorite books. Well, I have some signed copies of books. I have a, a signed copy of Charles Krauthammer's book. Uh, I have a signed copy of a Tom Wolfe book. Uh, I, have, I have some you know, uh, Churchill books, obviously. I have, I have an old set of his history of World War II. Uh, and then just in terms of books that I love, the Federalist Papers I refer to often, obviously. Uh, Alexis de Tocqueville I refer to. Quite often, I have the full papers of Abraham Lincoln, refer to that a lot. And then, of course, I have my, my Jewish books, my Sfarim. Uh, so that would be the Tanakh, the, the Torah, and the Prophets, and the Writings. I refer to that a lot. I, I have a lot of books, and I love all of them, honestly. I feel more comfortable surrounded by books. When I was in law school and I was lonely, I went out to bookstores, and I bought books, and I surrounded myself with books. And honestly, it made me feel emotionally better to be surrounded by great thinkers and be able to essentially converse with them across the centuries. David says, do you think an increasingly anti-Semitic platform from the Democratic Party may lead to an increase of American Jewish immigration to Israel in the near future? Well, yeah, I mean, I do. I, I think that you've seen this in Europe. I think that what you've seen in Europe is as anti-Semitism has increased, people are leaving. France is seeing a year-over-year -year decrease in the Jewish population because so many families are leaving and moving to Israel. If it turns out that America moves in the same direction, why exactly would American Jews stay in danger and not move somewhere else if it turns out they have nowhere else to, to go. So yeah, I do think that you'll see more Jews making Aliyah. Uh, let's see. Um, Chris says, Dear Ben, I've always had the personal goal of attending an Ivy League school. Based on your experiences at both Harvard and UCLA, is there a major difference between the two with regard to opportunity? I feel as if the only surefire way to have significant influence in academia, politics, etc., is to attend one of these schools. Thank you. Well, there's no question that credentialing matters an awful lot to folks because we're not allowed to take IQ tests publicly and we're not allowed to, to 
grade people on the basis of, of those sorts of tests. And so what people tend to do is they use degree as a stand-in for intelligence. So if someone graduated from Harvard, then we sort of assume they're smarter than somebody who graduated from the local junior college, for example, which sometimes is true and sometimes is not, actually. And in terms of practical knowledge, very often is not. With that said, you know, I, I, I believe that, that going to Harvard is a significant advantage. It does create social networks that allow you to, to take advantage of people that you know. Uh, there's a great book by, um, uh, what, what is his name, J.D. Vance, Hillbilly Elegy, where he talks about moving from sort of Appalachia to Yale Law School and how that changed his life. There's no question social networks matter. And Jesse says, hey, Ben, what are your thoughts on the massive Bryce Harper, Manny Machado contracts? I know the White Sox were at least in on Machado during the offseason. Well, I mean, my thought is that they got what they felt they could get in the market. I wouldn't have signed a contract for that much with these guys, particularly not Machado. I mean, at least Bryce Harper has a, has a track record of production and he doesn't have as much of an attitude problem. Machado wouldn't even run out ground balls with the Dodgers. So that, to me, is a, a massive red flag. Clinton says, Dear future President Shapiro, as of today, I am now a year-long subscriber, partly because I wanted to pose this question to you. In light of recent events involving anti-Semitism and fresh faces, can you help clarify as to why there are so many people out there who believe Israel is land stolen from Palestinians? Additionally, can you point to me to more evidence as to how or why Palestine is linked to terror organizations that push to oppress the Jewish state? Admittedly, I don't know much about the conflicts in Israel or their origins, and I think this is true for everyday Americans, thus making it difficult for them to condemn recent anti-Semitism, especially with the media muddying the waters. Thanks for all you do. A lot of people believe Israel is land stolen from Palestinians because they don't know their history. Israel is the historic Jewish homeland. The only reason anyone cares about it is because the Jews were there first. There's been continuous Jewish presence in Israel for legitimately three millennia. And the notion that Israel stole land that Jews have been living on forever is absolutely asinine and ridiculous. The British mandate limited Jewish immigration into British Palestine. They tried to prevent Jews from moving in. Jews were discriminated against and massacred in places like Hebron in 1929, long before there was a Jewish state there. There has never been an independent Palestinian state in that region ever. It was under the auspices of the Ottoman Empire. It was under the auspices of the British Mandate. It was never, there, was, there just wasn't. There was not an independent Palestinian state in that region. There are lots of other states. In fact, the term Palestinian used to refer to Jew. He used to refer to Jew because every Palestinian is, if you go back three generations, Syrian or Egyptian or Jordanian. 70% of, of Jordan is ethnically Palestinian. So there is a Palestinian state already. It exists in Jordan. If you want another two-state solution, one that was rejected by the Palestinians in, and all the Arab nations, by the way, in 1947-48, if you want a second one, you're going to have to have a government that actually wants to negotiate and create a peaceful situation. Instead, Palestinians have decided that the only solution is the complete wholesale destruction of the state of Israel. That is part of the Palestinian Authority mandate. It is part of their charter. It is part of the Hamas charter. The official government stance of Israel's quote-unquote negotiating partners is that Israel ought to be destroyed. That's not a negotiating partner. Israel's been willing to make territorial concessions repeatedly and has done so repeatedly. And it's weird because the Palestine Liberation Organization, supposedly created to liberate Palestine, was formed in 1964. In 1964, guess who controlled the West Bank and the Gaza Strip? Egypt controlled the Gaza Strip. Jordan controlled the West Bank, the so-called West Bank in Judea and Samaria. So why would you need to liberate Palestine if it was already controlled by Muslim countries? The answer, what they mean by Palestine Liberation Organization is exactly what Mark Lamont Hill has said. From the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free. No state of Israel destroy the place, kill, kill as many Jews as possible in the process. Okay. Time And if you want a good resource on this, there's a really good book by Eli Bard called Myths and Facts that in very simple fashion goes through a lot of the frequently asked questions about the Israel-Palestinian conflict. All right, time for some things that I like. So things I like today, there's a great new book out by Tim Carney of the Washington Examiner and the American Enterprise Institute. It's called Alienated America, Why Some Places Thrive While Others Collapse. And in it, Timothy Carney talks about why certain areas in the United States seem to be doing well while others seem to be doing very poorly. And he points out that the areas in the United States that have the least social cohesion tend to be the ones that voted heavily for President Trump in, for example, the Republican primaries. The people who feel dispossessed, people who feel that, they, they, that America is not what it used to be, that those people voted for President Trump because President Trump was, was resonating to their message and they were resonating to his. So what exactly is going on in these areas? Timothy Carney goes through it factor by factor. He talks about the economic effects of trade in certain areas as opposed to overall. He talks about the economic effects of robotization of, of massive industries. 
But mostly what he talks about is the fact that all of the units of social cohesion that used to exist, family, church, social institutions have collapsed in a lot of areas of the country. And that if you actually want to revitalize those areas of the country, it doesn't actually start at the factory per se. It's not a matter of economics alone, certainly. It is more a matter of rebuilding these social institutions and rebuilding the social fabric. It's a terrific book, Alienated America. You should go out and purchase it right now. It actually echoes a lot of the same themes that I hit in my new book that is coming out in just about a week and a half here, uh, the, the Right Side of History. You should go check out my book as well, but Alienated America is a really fantastic book by Timothy Carney. It's, a, it's an easy read and well-written. Go check that out. Okay, other things that I like. So I have to note a thing that I really like, a person that I really like. So my producer, Senya, unfortunately, is moving on, and she is wonderful. She is just terrific. I can't say enough wonderful things about Senya. She is a kind, generous human being. She deals with all of my foibles on a daily basis. But more than that, she is a warm soul. And I, I am so appreciative of the time that she has spent with us here at The Daily Wire and on The Ben Shapiro Show. She's just a terrific person. And you know, I, I feel like we've become good friends. And so I just want to wish her the best because this is her last day of work here. So she's liberated. She gets to go and do something fun. But we're definitely going to miss her. So uh, Senya is, is the chief thing human that I like today. Okay, time for a quick thing that I hate. Okay, so the thing that I hate today, uh, I talked about a little bit yesterday on my radio show, but Ayan Presley is another one of the fresh faces of Congress. She is from Massachusetts. She has not gotten anywhere near the attention of the other fresh faces. Nonetheless, she made an insane, ridiculous, and silly proposal yesterday. She suggested that we lower the voting age to 16. Since the days of abolitionists, suffragists, and civil rights activists, young people have been pushing the wheels of progress forward. These youth, our young people, who will inherit the nation we design here by virtue of our policies or by default of our policies and authority, these very same young people should also have a say in who represents them. For your consideration, Amendment number 127, which would lower the minimum voting age in federal elections from 18 to 16 years of age. Okay, yeah, good luck with that. I, my favorite thing about this is that she went on to explain why 16-year-olds should vote. She says many of them have jobs. Is that going to be a requirement now? You have to have a job to vote? If that's the case, I'm fine with abolishing all limits on age. If you just have, a job, have to have a job to vote, man, this is not going to go great for Democrats, honestly. But that's not really what she means. What she means is that we should continue to expand the voter base to a bunch of people who are dependent on government largesse. When you're 16 years old, you are still in a publicly run high school. And that means that your teachers and your peers are going to steer you how to vote. All of this is absolutely silly. 16-year-olds are less mature than they ever have been at any time in human history. 400 years ago, 16-year-olds were expected to move out of the house and be married already. Really. And even 150 years ago, 16-year-olds were getting ready to move out. They are already apprenticing themselves. They're already getting jobs. They're already getting ready to start a family. The average age of first marriage in the United States, even 50 years ago, was about 20 for both men and women. Now the average age of marriage is about 73 in the United States. If you are 26, you're still on your parents' health insurance program. If anything, we should be raising the voting age. And I'm speaking as someone who was probably qualified to vote when I was 16 since I was already in college. I would gladly, gladly have raised the voting age when I was 25 to prevent other people who were 25 from voting particularly if they're still living at home and reliant on mommy and daddy's health insurance plan. All righty. Well, we will be back here later today with two more hours. We'll be joined by Representative Lee Zeldin of New York. He's one of the Republicans who voted against the supposed faux anti-hate resolution from the Democrats. He'll stop by to explain why. You should stop by too. That's why you should subscribe so you can actually listen to those two hours. If not, we will see you here for the Sunday special. If you're a subscriber, the Saturday special, and then we'll see you here again on Monday. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. The Ben Shapiro Show is produced by Senya Villarreal, executive producer Jeremy Boring, senior producer Jonathan Hay. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover, and our technical producer is Austin Stevens, edited by Adam Saievitz. Audio is mixed by Mike Caromina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Olvera. Production assistant, Nick Sheehan. The Ben Shapiro Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright, Daily Wire 2019. <laughs> 